Hi, I'm Lars Wikman, and I run this odd little business on the internet called Underjord. Today I want to tell you a little bit about something called Phoenix Live View, which is a piece of tech spawned in the Elixir ecosystem for the Phoenix web framework. And it has been so compelling that there have been copies made in the PHP community with Laravel's Livewire, in the Ruby and Rails communities with Hotwire and Stimulus Reflux. And I know that there are others, but I don't keep track. To explain why Live View is interesting, it helps to understand some of the problems it is meant to solve. And to really explain those, I think we should take a few steps through the history of web development. If you don't care about the history part, in summary, Live View lets you skip writing a bunch of JavaScript, it removes an enormous duplication of effort. Done. Have fun. <laughs> So who am I to take you through the history of web development? Well, I got started with the web in the mid 90s and started doing websites using Notepad. I also spent a lot of time collecting animated GIFs, some of the best fancy pictures of dragons you've ever seen. I know some of the history of the web because I was there and I lived it. As the web grew, I started learning CSS, that was new, and then some JavaScript. And all in all, we called it the HTML. So that was dynamic HTML. It was very cool at the time. As my needs for sort of building websites grew, I learned some Perl, which I mostly used to generate bigger websites and reusing code through websites, reusing the markup. And then I got in touch with the CDI bin, and then shortly after PHP and that blew my web world wide open. It took a few years of uh, building web applications with forms and page refreshes before we got the browser API for XML HTTP request. And that was the start of what was known as Ajax, which let us take user interaction, fetch new data from the server, and update parts of the page to reflect the new information or the activity that was being taken. And this laid a foundation for all of current web development. It was a complete game changer. Then came jQuery. And jQuery brought with it much easier ways to manipulate the DOM, much easier ways to make these requests to the server. With these improved APIs, it shaped a whole generation of JavaScript usage to the extent that for the longest time you couldn't use Stack Overflow for JavaScript code without getting jQuery related answers. jQuery was essentially considered part of JavaScript for a long, long time. It also papered over some of the most heinous differences between browsers, which was super important at the time. It has also deeply influenced what APIs have been added to JavaScript over time so that the things we could do with jQuery eventually became entirely achievable in JavaScript itself. So this was the era when we started exposing XML and JSON endpoints from our servers for the browser to consume using JavaScript. And that practice absolutely exploded in popularity. And with that, we got the two-way binding frameworks. So we got Backbone, Ember, Knockout, Sprout Core, and those in turn led into Angular, which in turn led into React and Vue. And these frameworks cemented the idea that we build an API and then we build a single page application. This is what introduced the world of front-end development to the joys and the madness of state management. There are so many annoyances and so many trade-offs whenever you start managing state. Let's say you have a user in your database. Well, you also probably have a model representing that in your backend code. And then you have some surrounding logic for managing these users in your code. Then you have uh, some kind of JSON representation for your API. So you have this API then you have probably create, read, update, and delete for this API, probably a list as well, and maybe some specialized endpoints. And then you have 
the modeling of this user in your front-end framework. And once you have that, you probably have some additional code around it, and then you can render it to the browser. React has been the poster child of state management ever since Facebook unveiled the Flux idea, which then transformed into the Redux library, which was a very popular way of managing state in React for a long time. And it has since been succeeded by, I don't think just one solution, but a ton of different ones, as well as from what I gather, the idea that you probably don't need a specialized solution and should just stick it all in React. I don't know. I don't do React and I don't, don't follow it closely, but even from way over here, I've heard the noise about state management in React. I think the fact that React has spent so much time trying to get state management right indicates the inherent complexity of managing state. That complexity is doubled when you need to handle state on the front end and state on the back end and communicate between the two. And in most web applications, you can't get away from having state on the back end. So what happens in a typical web application is that you end up with these layers that are either very similar, like the user data structure is very similar across these layers. And in that case, they are fairly repetitive and mostly a waste of time. Or the data you store in the back end is fairly different from the way you use the data in the front end. And then all these layers become translation layers, introducing some level of complexity or doing some tasks in each layer. And the moment you add a field, either you're doing the repetitive task of adding that field to every layer, or you add the field and then you have to interpret that data in every translation layer. State in the client is not bad in itself, but it comes with a distinct cost. And where you see costs, you can usually spend some time and consider whether there are other trade-offs you can make. Now, Phoenix Live View makes entirely different trade-offs. Right away, we sacrifice offline first. If you need your application to work without a server, Live View is the wrong choice. It does away with building a public API by default. If your application requires multiple app platforms running different clients against the common API, that's not what Live View does. You can still do it in Phoenix, but it's not Live View. And part of the promise of Ajax was performance, sending only the part of the page that need to be updated, not requiring a page reload, and sending less data over the network. LiveView takes this much further. It replaces HTTP requests with a WebSocket, which reduces the overhead and allows the server to talk proactively to the client. It makes everything very snappy. Beyond that, we have this templating engine, which interprets your templates to figure out what parts are static and what parts are dynamic. And then when a change happens to your state, it can determine which parts that they actually need to send because the static parts never change. Those are sent once. And the dynamic parts that can change can be treated as small diffs. So you send these small diff payloads. Those are interpreted on the client side and patched into the DOM. It's very hard to make JSON more lean than this is. With the actor model of Elixir, we can keep the state of whatever the user is up to in a process on the back end. This is our live view and it communicates over this WebSocket. And whenever the state changes, we can use the template diffing tools to figure out what parts have changed, send that diff. The back end provides the front end. So how is the state updated? When we build the template, we can define different types of interactions, such as clicks and submitting forms or changing fields that will trigger events to the live view backend. Those are handled by handler functions. Those handler functions can modify the state. If they modify the state, that will produce a diff. It will be sent to the client for rendering and the front end will change. Or you can get a signal from inside of the backend system. 
maybe you're receiving a webhook, maybe you're reading from a sensor, maybe you just updated your weather data and you want to show that to your user. Well, you make the live view actor listen for that information. It receives the message. It applies a handler function that updates the state. It produces a diff, sends it to the client and shows it. This makes it very, very easy to make real time user interfaces on the web. For you as a developer, the path from the state of the live view actor to whatever the user will see is essentially a deterministic path through the template. This means that you can focus on working with your live view as a number of handler functions and a template. And the only things that matter are messages you're getting in and how they are changing the state as a result. So live view focuses on solving the same problems that we've been working on since Ajax first came around, which is essentially, how do we make it faster? How do we make it send less data? How do we make it more interactive? And how do we make the development process more manageable? A modern front-end development project can easily grow to be as big as the back-end project it's being built upon. It's usually done this way to provide this high degree of flexibility and power when it comes to providing a great user experience and a highly interactive experience. And if you don't need a very interactive experience, you would probably stick to server-side rendering because that's very efficient. With LiveView, you're still building a front-end, but you are also providing a single cohesive environment, a single language for your developers to work with. That means the same tooling, unified testing, and all the conveniences that come with the Elixir ecosystem while you can still provide a rich, highly interactive, real-time user interface for your end users. When it fits the requirements, and I found that it often does, it's been an incredibly productive tool for building web applications for me. Nothing else I've used even comes close. I hope this gives you a good idea of what LiveView is, what it does, what problems it's trying to solve, and what problems it isn't trying to solve. If you're curious about what I'm up to, you should check out on the URL.io and go to the newsletter and sign up for that because that's where you get that information. If you're an Elixir developer looking for a job or you're looking to get into Elixir, I would suggest checking out the URL.io site and looking at the jobs page where I host some lovely companies that are looking for Elixir developers. Now, if you're a company looking to hire Elixir developers, you can also reach out to me. I'll put a link down below for you as well, where you can read more about how I can help with that. Until next time, stay curious out there.